Rick Delisle, born in 1947, joined the US Army at the age of 17 where he was trained as a radio and television specialist. His career as a disc jockey began in Texas in 1968 and took him to West Berlin in 1978. There he hosted an early morning radio program on the Army Station American Forces Network or AFN for short. He became famous with a wake-up call, I'm Air Force Sergeant Rick Delisle, reminding you that the rock and roll is just a state of mind. From 1985 he worked for the radio station in the American sector, RIAS Berlin, where he established RIAS 2, a 24-hour youth program and thus became an integral part of the radio culture of the four power city, especially among the youth in the west but also in the east. Today as in Rias times, he greets his listeners every day at Berlin's Rundfunk 91.4 with Hi, Ikebins, Alter Ami, Rick Delein. On a Wednesday, October 3, 1990, German reunification was formally completed when the accession of the German Democratic Republic to the Federal Republic of Germany took effect. How did your daily work routine change from the 2nd to the 4th of October? At that time, you were hosting the morning program at RIAS 2. I guess hardly anything changed. It was, it was another day. And as a, it's a, it's a bit, I think historically, people who are in a historical place when something historic happens don't really check it. <laughs> It's a normal day. I got to get up. I have to feed the kids. I have to go to school. I have to have breakfast. And then, and uh, uh, there were lots of huge political things happening in the in, in this part of the world. But if, like everybody else, you go to work and you do your job. And it's not like I was Walter Cronkite or <laughs> do, doing the news somewhere. It's doing a rock and roll show and say, "Hey, man, uh, stay cool." And here's you know another Bruce Springsteen song. So I, it really didn't change that. Your music programs were aimed at a young audience. You were very popular because of your strong American accent and your wordplay. After reunification, did you feel any changes, especially with regard to the influence of the occupying power, the USA? Things changed for me because I, the most we had um, hundreds of thousands of people listening to the radio station. Uh, the average in those days was around 350,000 people. Um, and half of those were in East Berlin, you would never see them. And all of a sudden there were over 100,000 people on the street when I would open up my mouth and order a hot dog somewhere and go, ah, oh, you're the guy from the radio. So my life changed a little bit. Um, the, uh, the influence that America had in Berlin at that time I think was extremely positive because uh, these people have been told for decades uh, it was extremely negative <laughs> and getting out of this communist dictatorship and into the free world and noticing that everything they told you wasn't exactly correct something sure but not everything and one of the things that was obviously uh, different was the fact that I that actually these uh, these American guys are okay did you still go to the eastern part of the city in uniform during that time as the army leadership wanted you to go? What were the reactions like? What were your feelings? Yeah, well, one of the reasons, uh, yes, in uniform, uh, it, it was uh, a wish, <laughs> not an order, but a wish that, you, uh, that uh, uh, soldiers would go across Checkpoint Charlie once a month in, in, uh, in uniform, uh, the Russians came over all the time. And part of it was to, you know, to show them, hey, we consider East Berlin as much a part of Berlin as it was when these, uh, when these accords were made up after the, uh, at the end of the Second World War. Um, nobody talked to you. I would go come uh, in the dress blues, and sit on Alexander Platz, and nobody's going to talk to you. I mean, you'd be so you'd immediately be a target 
for the state security people if they saw you talking to an American soldier in, in, on, on Alexanderplatz. So it's like people left you alone. There were a few stores that, that specialized in stuff for Americans. Uh, most of those people spoke English, which was handy. <laughs> and uh, you could go in there and do this and that. The books, I bought lots of German books while I was there because they were uh, unique editions and, uh, and also not so expensive. But uh, yeah. You know from your own experience that a long-lasting bond, especially in West Berlin, strengthened the friendly relationship with the USA. What personal expectations did you have at that time with regard to the further development of this friendship now between the United Berlin and the USA? By the reunification, 90, the Allies were all still here. And, and the American clubs were here, American GIs on the street, uh, especially West Berlin had lots of clubs. Uh, Uh, especially for Americans. I do remember a guy who came from New York City and opened a string of hot dog uh, stores, hot dog restaurants in East Berlin. He called himself Mr. Hot Dog, <laughs> which was, I thought, really great. This is a guy who was from New York City. It was like all set up like a New York City hot dog stand. Um, and, and lots of people were op open, I think, for uh, the real American culture. And... Uh, Uh, but it was, you know, you have to, you have to think about this uh, in the, this, say, a two or three year period. Everything changed almost every day. You went from 1989, sitting every week going, are the, are the communists going to start shooting the demonstrators on the street this weekend? And every weekend you're going, next weekend they're going to shoot for sure. They can't let this go on forever. To... Uh, all of a sudden, all of these uh, groups saying, hey, things have to change here in, in East Germany. And, and then it's all becoming one country. And you're like juggling all these balls in the air, trying to figure out what kind, where am I and what's going on here and who's going to win and what's going to happen. So it's, it's hard, sort of hard to judge what was really going on. Like, I, my theory is, like many people, if you're living somewhere when, where historical things are happening, you don't notice it that much. You're going, you're going about doing your job. Now, if you're Everhart Diepken, the mayor, of, uh, uh, the mayor of Berlin or something, that's a whole different uh, ball of wax. But for people like me who are just normal going off to do their jobs, uh, things don't change much. What expectations or wishes do you have today? It's true that knowledge is power. A little bit of knowledge can be very dangerous. And these days there's too many people who think they know what the United States is about and have no idea. <laughs> I'm sure it, it functions the other way too. Lots of people, every GI who's ever been to stationed in Stuttgart thinks he knows what Germany's about. <laughs> All he really knows is what Stuttgart is about. Um, and, um, and I don't know if that is going to change or not. It's sort of crazy because we have all of these things now, internet and Skype and a thousand ways to, to keep in touch, uh, which, which somehow makes it uh, not so important anymore. If I had to save money forever to, you know, save money all of my working life to spend a couple of weeks in Florida uh, once after I retire, Uh, that would be something that was burned in my memory. If I'm telephoning on Skype with Florida every week, it's like, oh yeah, okay, let's talk to Cousin Fred. He lives in Tampa now. Um, so I, I have, I, I, I don't know what to expect. I have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, and probably I never did. It's sort of like if you live here, you let it happen. Berlin is such an amazing place to live. And, and I learned a lot from Berliners the longer I lived here. I've lived here longer than I lived in my in, in this city I was born in, in Milwaukee. Uh, and uh, it's sort of like, hey, take it as the way it comes and then we'll figure out a way to deal with it then. What story is hidden in the photo you selected from 1990? This is taken in the uh, studio of Rios II. Um, 
huge studio. It would fit a hundred people in the studio easily. It's a, a very strange for an American disc jockey to have a studio this big. Um, this t-shirt is great. I was in a rock band for a couple of years uh, while being a disc jockey. And so I think I stole it from the keyboard guy there. So uh, can't even buy this t-shirt anymore. Uh, but I, I do remember mm, this was when I really started thinking I've become accepted. Uh, I'd been in Berlin for a while, yeah, 12 years, 13 years, 78, 88, yeah. Um, and I mean, never went to school to learn German. If you listen to the German version of this, guys and girls, my German is terrible. <laughs> I learned German on the street, and so I sort of sound like, in a, like a Berliner. And most Berliners don't know anything about German. <laughs> Die der das is uh, strange. <laughs> they don't know what that's for. That, thank you very much. <laughs>